to he for battles. And the British had defeated him, and by, by that I mean the British had, had the field afterwards. And General Green had had to withdraw. He had still an army, and he still kept the British occupied, and he still kept the British worried. And while Green did it on sort of a state level, Sumter and Marion did it on a local level. We were also blessed with, with other continental officers. William Washington came down to fight with us. Henry Lee came to fight with us. And finally, in 1781, when Lord Cornwallis, who had left our state and gone to Virginia, had had to surrender to forces that were led by George Washington, not South Carolina, but George Washington, continental. I decided that it was safe enough in South Carolina for the British had gradually withdrawn. They were no longer making any pretenses about being in the up country. They were withdrawing more and more towards Charleston. And so I urged General Green, who was feeling more and more confident all the time, and we managed to get our troops together and to force a, a major battle in Utah Springs. And the British were in Charleston and practically nowhere else. And so I decreed that the legislature of South Carolina will meet again. We met there at the end of 1781, we met at Jacksonboro. And I, I chose Jacksonboro in particular, not because it was an important place, but because it was a prominent place, it was rather accessible, and it was near Charleston. To have the legislature meet at Jacksonboro was sending a message to everyone. I was proud of it. I was also proud a year later when the British finally left Charleston. And General Green and I led the parade into Charleston. We had other leaders. Uh, not our militia leaders. Nobody liked something. Nobody like Marion. But General Green and, and, and one of his favorites, General Wayne, we marched into Charleston. <laughs> I entertained. For the first time in years, I reoccupied this house. You know, when the war began, I owned about 180 slaves. They were all gone. My house had been badly treated by the British. Not only had the house deteriorated during the years, but they had drawn pictures on the wall and they had taken rugs from the floor and they had carved their names in the, in the woodwork. But it was mine. And I brought General Green there. And South Carolina then proclaimed itself once more as a state of these United States we were beginning to call ourselves. And I began to practice law again. I, I didn't enjoy the law as much as I had. I speculated in land. I had bought a good bit of land. I had a good many debts. I was relieved by the legislature that suspended payments of debts for a while. It gave us time to make a little money, maybe sell a little property so we would have enough money to secure what properties were left. When the new United States government began in 1780s and such, we decided we needed a new constitution. I was one of those delegates from South Carolina. I went up there to Philadelphia to, high write, to help write a constitution. And I did, and I played a significant role. South Carolina was still an important state. South Carolina had at one time been, with maybe the exception of Virginia, maybe the exception of Massachusetts. Uh, we had been the most important of all the states. And there were 13 of us in 1788, and we were trying to write this Constitution. And, and South Carolina still had a, a power among the other colonies. And so I was able to secure several things in the Constitution of the United States. 
And one of the things I hoped to do was to keep the states together because some people, particularly those people in the north, representing those northern colonies, they wanted to do away with slavery. And I just told them more than once, and I was respected for having said it, that if you want to do away with slavery, then you do away with the South. It almost broke us up. And we, we developed a compromise. We, we counted the slaves as three-fifths of a person. That is, for every five slaves, you count three. And that gave us representation in the legislature, the national legislature. We call it the House of Representatives. We recognize slavery not by word, but on, on several occasions throughout the Constitution. We talked about other persons. And it was a euphemism, and we knew what it meant. Everybody knew what it meant. I was flattered when after the legislature met and they created the Supreme, the Supreme Court, which was organized under the Constitution but not specified, and the Congress decided that, that we would have five justices and, and gave the President the right to name the justices, that was in the Constitution, George Washington decided that he would name me. I, I was on the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court. And I served for two years. The problem was my district was in New England. And, and I would have to go in, in these long tours, you know, and I would get in my, in my carriage and go all the way up there. And it was cold up there, and, and I was getting older all the time. I went, I went with James Iredale, he's from North Carolina, and uh, just, just above that little uh, hamlet they've got up there called Char Charlotte. And uh, together we would go and we would hold court and we would run the circuit up there in New England. But it took me away from South Carolina. It took me away from my properties. And my properties needed 10 people. And so I resigned from the United States Supreme Court. And I took a position on the South Carolina Supreme Court. And that meant I also wrote the circuit, of course, but it was in South Carolina. And as a judge, I not only dispensed justice but I ruled the courtroom. <laughs> and every now and then, uh, these, uh, these grand juries that we always impound, occasionally they had the nerve to cite judges for improper conduct. I was cited one time because uh, I, I was told that I did not get to, to the courtroom at the appointed hour. And that they were, they were dissatisfied, they had to wait for the judge to come. So one day, when I was in the other country, I just made this statement. It is never 10 o'clock until I am in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it's, it's when I began to have this, these problems. And, and, and I realized that I was, I was forgetting things. And my wife was sick. <coughs> And she died. And I was lost. My children were gone. And I was living by myself. And the joy of life had gone. I tried to get back into politics in 1795 when George Washington uh, suggested that we sign a treaty that John Jay had written with the British that was so blatantly pro-British and anti-American I was one of those who made violent speeches against the Jay Treaty. And, and my violent speech was taken down and, and circulated. At that time, I had also written to George Washington, who was the president of this United States now, and I suggested to him that if he wanted to appoint me to the United States Supreme Court, again, I would accept the job. And, people read my speech on the Jay Treaty, and they considered it was rambling, and it was non-factual, and it was intemperate, and I heard that criticism, but back home I was, I was not feeling good, and I decided I would withdraw my name, and so I wrote to President of Washington now, George Washington, the President and told him I would withdraw my name. And, but before he got my letter, the 
United States Senate had refused to confirm me as a justice of the Supreme Court. I didn't, I didn't know that until, until after the fact. And that, plus the fact that I was so lonely, caused me one day, a, a couple of years ago, when I was feeling so old and so tired and, and so infirm, that I walked out into the Ashley River and walked as far as I could walk until the water was over my head. And I thought that I would end it all. But a man saw me, a free man, a black man who was free and slave. And he saved me. He came out to get me and pulled me away. But my brother Evan, who had always been a dear friend, not just a brother, but a dear friend, he took charge of my finances and of my public affairs. And I lived here in, in this house with a keeper until this very day. And I do not look forward to tomorrow. But I have enjoyed my time with you. And I wish you Godspeed and good luck. Uh, 
time. The place that I'm going to talk a little bit more about is right here. This is Fort Watson. The site of a battle, the site of a fort, and the site where Hezekiah Mayhem gained his primary fame. So let's uh, zoom in to the uh, geography, the map of Pineville. The village of Pineville is, is right there. Those of us who were on the tour uh, visited the, the three homes in the historic district and the church today. Mayo's plantation was right there, right next to Murray's Ferry on the Santee River, near where, uh, to place it for the tour folks, near where we had lunch today at Lifeland Plantation. Belle Isle Plantation, there, the grave of Francis Mary. This was known as the River Road, that's Murray's Ferry Road, and Murray's Ferry Road led to Charleston, across the Santee River, and on to uh, King Street and further north. Okay, a little factual information here on Hezekiah Mayo. He was born, we think, around 1739 in St. Stephen's Parish. By 1772, he had become a successful planter on the Santee River. He married first to Ann Guerin, who died, and then Mary Palmer, and they had two daughters. In uh, in 1776, he was a member of the Second Provincial Congress, and he volunteered for the war. He was later captain in the militia, and he became a captain of cavalry, a horse captain. 1779, he became a major and he commanded a light dragoon regiment. He soon joined his neighbor, Francis Marion, and became a member of Marion's brigade, and again a commander of cavalry. Muzon's map shows Mayo's plantation on the Santee River, Nelson's Ferry on the Santee River. Now, on our tour today, I pointed out a lot of ferries, which aren't too important today, but were very important then, as the only way to get across these major rivers. There were three major rivers, uh, major ferries in this area, Murray's, Nelson and Lynch's, and they were critical in the war, especially these two here for the point that we're going to talk about, in that the, the King's Highway ran from Camden down this side of the river, crossed at Nelson's Ferry, went by Black Oak Road to Charleston. That was the main supply route from Charleston to Camden. The British, in fact, the Colonel Watson, built a fort on top of an old English, uh, an old Indian mound on the Santee River next to the King's Highway. Of course, the purpose there was to control the traffic from Charleston to Camden and from Charleston to 96. The traffic on the river and the traffic on the road. Fort Watson, 
famous for Mayo's Tower. During uh, April 15th, 1823, in 1781. Now, this was part of the campaign to drive the British out of the South, to cut off the supply routes between the the, Charles, the uh, British in Charleston and the forts along the Santee River, uh, all, all the way up to uh, to 96. Now, uh, this drawing of Fort Washington shows that it was an Indian mound. The Santee River is out here. Over here is a, is a little pond or a lake called Scotch Lake. And the British uh, built a, fall, uh, a small uh, encampment on top of the Indian mound. And, and through the, the magic high technology. I'm going to show you how this worked. Since I wasn't back there, and I don't have any photographs of the actual event, I've taken the account uh, of it that was written by Henry Lee, Light Horse Harry Lee, uh, and we'll give you this uh, animation, this wonderful Walt Disney-like animation of the Battle of Fort Watson. The Indian Mound, the British encamp on top. There's the Santee River, there's Lake Scott, and uh, a little forest there. And Francis Marion, Light Horse Harry Lee, and under them, Hezekiah Mayo, advanced on the fort. And it was immediately determined that it would be very difficult to dislodge the British uh, from this fort, especially given the information that Colonel Watson was advancing on them from the east, coming from Camden. Marion and Lee the uh, the British seeing what was happening, dug a trench from the river to the bottom of the mound, which enabled them to get water to prepare for the siege that they figured that, Manning, uh, that Marion and Lee were going to impose on their fort. And at that point, Marion and Lee said, it's going to be almost impossible for us uh, to stay here long enough in a siege position in that Colonel Watson is returning to the fort. At that point, Hezekiah Mayo, who really didn't have any professional engineering training, but was apparently uh, an engineer at heart and had done this sort of thing before and had run a farm and had probably had some uh, doings with the, the ferry near his home, came up with the idea of building a tower that was higher than the Indian Mound. Now, neither side had artillery. They had rifles and sidearms. They did not have artillery. So Mayo's idea was to cut the remaining trees. Now, the British had cut most of the forest, but cut the re the remaining trees and to build a tower, put sharpshooters at the top of the tower and shoot down on Fort Watson. And pretty soon Walt Disney's gonna get to work. <laughs> <laughs> and haul them in. 
and they erected the tower in one night. On the morning after the tower was erected, the sharpshooters uh, rained down fire from the top of the tower at the same time that Marion's men advanced on the trench, the water trench on the side, to stop the water and to, and to shoot up from this side. And immediately the commander, McCoy, uh, saw what was happening and he, and he waved the white flag and the battle was over. The American forces uh, realized the importance of Mayo's Tower, and as they went after the uh, British forts further up country at 96 and at Augusta, they also used the tower. It was successful at Augusta, uh, it was not successful at 96. Hezekiah Mayo. Uh, was awarded with his own legion. He became a lieutenant colonel and commanded a battalion of light dragoons. In 1781 and July 17th, he was sent down Black Oak Road uh, to Monk's Corner. And there were several engagements, and they engaged the British at Quinby Ridge, south of Monk's Corner, between Monk's Corner and Charleston. And the British commander uh, stopped the advancing forces of Mayhem and others by uh, tearing up the bridge and, and stopping the, the troops. Um, Mayhem was involved in that. It was not considered a, a, a victory for the Americans or the British, but the British then moved on into Charleston. Another battle that Mayo was involved in in November was a raid on Fairlawn Plantation in which his troops captured a supply, a warehouse, and a hospital and uh, released the the uh, uh, patients and prisoners who were held there and took the supplies and burned the hospital. In 82, in March, Mayhem joined with O'Ree and a cavalry were joined together in a cavalry unit, uh, but they never really got along. Now, the speakers be before me have mentioned this disagreement. They also began to disagree with Sumter. And Ori and Manning, uh, Ori and Mayhem refused to serve under Sumter. And uh, and then in 1782 at the Jacksonboro Assembly, where Mayhem and Marion were delegates. The purpose, one of the purposes of that assembly was to identify the Tories, those who were not on the Patriot side, and to figure out what to do with them. And there was a loud chorus of great punishment for these people who were not fighting for the revolutionary cause. Marion and Mayo were in the group that opposed the severe actions on the Tories. And, and Marion at that point, and I understand uh, that Mayhem was on his side in this argument, said that uh, the homes of the Tories should not be destroyed, the supply lines to the, to the Tories' homes should not be destroyed, uh, and the wives and children of the, of the Tories uh, should not be hurt in any way. Now, a little sideline here. Nelson's Ferry 
which was the which was the ferry to get to Fort Watson, was controlled by the Nelson family. They were Tories. And toward the end of the war, they returned to England. And their land was confiscated. And one of my ancestors, Theodore Godine, was granted possession of Nelson's Ferry, as well as Murray's, Murray's Ferry, which he had owned, and Lanoue's Ferry. Now, um, I was in a meeting recently with, with Will Nelson, who heads a law firm, Nelson Mullins, in Columbia, one of the largest in the state, who is of the Nelson family. And he was interested in looking at the history of Nelson's Ferry and the Nelson family. And he determined, and he's writing this into a book, but he determined that the Nelson family indeed were Tories and indeed did flee the Patriots, went back to England, but soon they came back and they resettled in Charleston um, and he is one of their descendants. Now Hezekiah Mayo, after the Jacksonboro Assembly, became ill and he retired to his plantation. The British heard that he was there. They went to his plantation, they captured him, and he was paroled, which meant that he agreed to put down his arms and not fight again. A few years later, the war was over. The American government and the state government began to find ways to, to get money into the system and to tax the people. Hezekiah Mayo was one of those who went to Kansas and opposed these new taxation, the taxes that the, that the state and the, the federal government was now placing on the people. And when he was served a writ by a sheriff in Camden, he forced the sheriff to eat the writ. <laughs> now, we don't know a whole lot about Hezekiah Mayhem's attitude, but I think that story uh, tells a lot about Hezekiah Mayhem. Soon thereafter, he went back home and he died peacefully at his plantation. Now his plantation, we did not visit today, as you, you will see why. But this is a plaque that's placed on his plantation in Pineville, Mayhem Plantation, the burial place of Colonel Hezekiah Mayhem, a native of St. Stephen's Parish, Berkeley County, South Carolina. Born 1739, he died 1789, he's 50 years old. He was a distinguished soldier and a patriot of the American Revolution. This is why we didn't go there. Mayhem's plantation is now owned by a man from Chicago, whose name I will tell you in secret later. <laughs> For the past several years, <coughs> Chief Godine and some other people in Pineville have been trying to get this gentleman to clear the road to Mayhem's grave. To no avail, to no action. So this past year, we got the state archaeologist involved, involved, Dr. John Leader. And the gentleman in Chicago uh, was sent a statement on the status of South Carolina law on cemeteries, which says that if, if a cemetery is on private property, the owner of that private property does not have to do anything with the cemetery. But if members 
of the family of the people buried in that cemetery request admission, permission to go to the cemetery, to clean it up, to visit it, they must be allowed that permission. So that was the law that was sent to this gentleman. To which he replied, so we sent it again. And we visited again. Secretly, by how I might add. <laughs> we couldn't even go by air, of course. So we begin to see, as we go through the Santee Swamp, the grave and a monument to Hezekiah Mayo. We, we had to take uh, uh, machetes and hacksaws to be able to clear it this much. The, the graves are there. At least six graves are within that fence. There are no headstones. But there is the monument, which was erected in 1845, I remember he died in 1789. Was erected in 1845 by one of his descendants, Joshua John Ward, who was a successful planter on the Waccamaw River in Georgetown County. He erected that monument in the memory of his ancestor, Hezekiah Mayer. And on that monument, it says this. Within this cemetery and in the bosom of the homestead, which he cultivated and embellished while on earth, lie the mortal remains of Colonel Hezekiah Mayo. He was born in the parish of St. Stephen and died A.D. 1789 at 50 years, leaving a name unsullied in social and domestic life, and eminent for devotion to the liberties of his country and for the achievements in arms and the revolution which established her independence. Impelled by the spirit of freedom which animated his countrymen, he zealously and courageously devoted himself to its support and promoted the cause of American independence by his services in the state committees instituted by the recommendation of the General Congress in the Jacksonboro Assembly and in various other civil capacities. Successfully a captain in the 1st Rifle Regiment, a commander of horse in Marion's Brigade, and a lieutenant colonel of an independent corps of cavalry. Raised by authority of General Green, he bore the efficient and conspicuous part in the capture of the British posts and a series of skillful maneuvers and gallant actions which resulted in the final extinction of the British Dominion in South Carolina and secured to her and to the Confederacy the blessings of peace, liberty, and independence. His relative, Joshua John Ward of Waccamaw, unwilling that the last abode of an honest man, a faithful patriot, and a brave and successful soldier should be forgotten and unknown, has erected this memorial in 1845. Keith, nor anyone else in Pineville is a descendant of Hezekiah Mayer. So Keith got working on that, and in about two months, he discovered two descendants of Hezekiah Mayer. Now he had two daughters, only one married, only one had children, and they sort of disappeared into history. But he found uh, two women, one in New Jersey and one in Georgetown, who could trace their lineage back to Hezekiah Mayer. He wrote them a letter, sent them a picture of this monument and the inscription that's on it, and said, would you help us get access to this graveyard and this monument so that it can be cleaned up? according to South Carolina law. And they wrote back and said, 